They feed an animal GM crops for 90 days at low concentrations and figure if it passes 90 day test, then we can feed it to humans at high volume for the rest of their lives. It's complete arrogance and extremely dangerous. One of Monsanto's plans is to introduce Terminator technology. It's not yet introduced, but it can have a catastrophic effect on agriculture around the world. It's a technology that forces plants to grow sterile seeds so that farmers cannot plant them year after year. Now, Monsanto, when it was originally developed by a number of companies, including the USDA, they were targeting the developing countries where 1.4 billion farmers save their seeds. If there's changes in weather, if there's damage from insects or from disease, we have a huge diversity of plants growing on farmers' fields around the world. We can find the genetics to withstand these changes. But if you wipe out that diversity and limit it just to the few seeds that are available in the catalog, you are risking the entire population's food supply in order to promote the profits of these companies. So this is a huge and horrific mess. And the world has risen up against Terminator technology because they want to protect the ability of farmers to save seeds year after year and not turn them into bio-surfs where they go back and like, like, a, new, like a new bio-colonialism where the Monsantos of the world force farmers to buy seeds year after year in order to maintain a, life, a, a profit or a lifestyle. The Department of Justice and Department of Agriculture have teamed up to do an evaluation of whether the agriculture industry in the United States has reached a level of monopoly or a duopoly or whatever. And uh, I certainly think that it's very, very dangerous right now, that it's, it's too concentrated. Um, they're controlling prices, they're controlling distribution, they're pushing their GM seeds, eliminating the availability of non-GM seeds, reducing the genetic diversity, uh, and basically keeping farmers desperate. They're always removing enough money from the system to keep farmers desperate, which is one way that they apparently control them or convince them to keep doing whatever the next magic bullet is from Monsanto and these other companies. Contamination is a real serious issue. Um, the biotech industry originally promised it would be impossible to contaminate. In fact, one executive from a company testified in Europe that you'd be more likely to get pregnant from a toilet seat than be contaminated by a GM crop. Now they've changed their tune and say, well, contamination is inevitable, but it's not important. Uh, it's very important. Contamination happens at a higher rate than anyone's predicted. Um, someone was looking at uh, genetically modified alfalfa, which is out in very small quantities right now because it was taken off the market because it was approved illegally, but a small amount got on there. So someone was checking it in 2008. There was a 3% contamination of the 200 lots that he tested. In 2009, it was up to 12%. In canola, which cross-pollinates very easily and the seeds move by wind, they looked at 33 bags of non-GMO canola seed. 32 of the 33 had at least a very tiny amount of contamination. It is difficult to get clean seed in canola, a little bit less difficult in corn, a little bit less difficult in soy, depending on the cross-pollination. But you also have contamination year after year. You plant GM canola in one year, and if you plant non-GM canola, you'll still have over 1% contamination for the next 16 years because unharvested canola seed can drop and into, the, into the soil and germinate year after year, and they produce thousands of seeds, and they also partially drop and not get harvested. So there's a contamination over time. Then you have this bizarre, ridiculous movement to introduce pharmaceuticals and industrial chemicals grown inside the plant. And we've had a near miss uh, a few years ago where there was corn varieties engineered to produce a vaccine for pig diarrhea. And the following year, the corn sprouted, the stubble remained inside a, corn, inside a soybean field and was harvested, and they found that out just in time and saved it from the food supply. But I suspect that other of these industrial chemical producing crops have contaminated the food supply at some point. I think it's just ridiculous that they plant crops that produce pharmaceutical chemicals outdoors and in food crops. Years ago, there was a few countries in sub-Saharan Africa that had a famine. And so the US sent genetically modified corn as a food aid. When they discovered it was genetically modified, they asked the US to please substitute non-GM corn 
and the U.S. refused. Some countries decided to accept it but said, please mill it so it won't be in seed form so our farmers won't plant it. The U.S. said, tough. You have to eat it or starve. Fortunately, South Africa came in and milled it. But one country, Zambia, sent out a fact-finding team to the U.S. and Europe. And they came back, and for many reasons, including scientific reasons, they said, absolutely do not allow genetically modified corn to be distributed to the famine victims in this country. So they were able to find other sources of food. But this really upset the U.S. because the myth was that GMOs would feed the hungry world, and here was a hungry country saying no. So they did a full court press on Zambia, and I visited there and heard some of the stories. There was a couple of Jesuit priests who were talking at conferences about the inappropriateness of genetic engineered crops based on the statistics that they had gathered. So the U.S. government tried to stifle the Jesuit priests. Colin Powell contacted the Vatican, and someone else contacted the head of the Jesuits in the U.S., and they kept trying to, they were lying about what these Jesuit priests were saying. And I spoke to and interviewed one of the Jesuit priests. Um, one of the ministers, I believe the Minister of Agriculture, was introduced to the, minister, the Secretary of Agriculture in the U.S., Ann Veneman, and when she heard he was from Zambia, she just rebuffed him, saying, backward country, and walked away. They sent congressmen and senators and professors. It was like they were just doing their best to try and convince Zambia that genetic engineering was okay. But the Zambian people, the Zambian scientists, and the government held their ground. And I think it was a great, a very smart idea because, you see, those that get food aid, 90% of their caloric intake is the aid itself. So if the, if the food aid was genetically modified BT corn or Roundup Ready corn, that means they were going to have a much higher level of this genetically modified crop in their system than any animal has ever been fed in a laboratory for a test. And if BT toxin does in fact disrupt the immune system or have toxic reactions or cause leaky gut or any of these things that it might do, then this particular population that's already uh, malnourished and probably immune deficient would be just absolutely targets for a disaster. So I actually congratulated the government for finding other non-GMO foods when I was there and uh, went on national television and national radio saying, you know, thank you for, for fighting off the American bully in this case. Uh, a colleague of mine was um, debating a senior executive from USAID, which is a big uh, pro-GM organization from the U.S. government. And they, they were debating in South Africa, and after the lights went down, the cameras stopped. They were continued to argue. And in the middle of this executive's anger, she let it loose, saying, you just wait. There'll be so much GM corn in South Africa, no one in Africa could plant non-GM corn. So this was an indication of their plan for contaminating the African continent. This was their plan. It's interesting that when it comes to safety regulations, the biotech industry insists that its crops are no different from conventional natural varieties. When it comes to patenting, they say, oh no, it's completely unique and worthy of patenting. Uh, patenting of life, patenting of crops, these are real problems that have allowed the biotech juggernaut to take off and to sacrifice issues of health for profit. Uh, we need to re-examine and revoke these, this concept of patenting life and also look at the way that they actually file patents on indigenous knowledge. Uh, companies have tried to patent flour used for chapati, for chapati breads in India, for neem in India, which is a natural product that's been developed for years, for, for basmati rice, for all these different things. They'll go in like bioprospectors and biopirates to steal some of the indigenous resources that have possibly been de developed by farmers over generations. And because they discover some ways in which the uh, characteristics work on a molecular level, they file a patent, and then they can sell the products of their patent back to the indigenous countries that developed it. So it's an absolutely unfair situation and needs to be looked at. Now, my focus is primarily the food safety. And the, I chose food safety because I believe that's the leverage to get rid of GMOs. You can be very against Monsanto. You can watch the world according to Monsanto and want to break something at the end of it. But it doesn't really speak so much about the health, so you don't realize that eating a corn chip might be just that bad, you know, and the soy might be just that bad. There's tremendous 
harm that can come from eating GMOs if you look at the animal feeding studies, the livestock issues, and what's happened in the US since GMOs were introduced from a correlational side. So if you, if you talk about the patent issue or the environmental issue or the social justice issue or corporate takeover, you can arouse anger in people, but they may just go out and buy a GMO and eat it. If you explain that eating a corn chip that's genetically engineered might turn your intestinal bacteria into living pesticide factories, then they put the brakes on for themselves and their family. And that is what's going to be leveraged for getting rid of GMOs, when people understand the health dangers and make healthier choices. The bees are dying in a thing called colony collapse disorder, which is not well understood. Now, it's, in my opinion, it's definitely not primarily caused by GMOs because they're dying in large numbers in other countries where they don't plant GMOs. More recent information suggests that the seed treatments from neonicotinoid insecticides are the cause. Now, these are insecticides created from nicotine or tobacco. When biotech companies introduced a variety of BT corn that kills the rootworm, they found that it wasn't very effective for the first few weeks of the corn's, corn plant's life. So the, the rootworm or, or soil-based organisms could destroy the seed and the early plant. So what they did is they developed a way to encapsulate a systemic insecticide based on tobacco called neonicotinoid insecticides and um, put them on the seeds and the insecticide would then infiltrate into the seed and into the plant and exude out of all the different cells of the plant for several weeks. That way it would sort of do the job to protect against the soil-based organisms until the BT kicked in. But this neonicotinoid insecticide is known to disrupt the navigation ability and memory of bees where they may not be able to get back to the hive. Now, it was believed that the seed treatments, that these type of seed treatments were responsible in large part or completely for colony collapse disorder. And when they banned these type of insecticides from several countries in Europe, like in Italy, the next year there was no colony collapse the next year except in one hive where they used the old seeds that still had it. They couldn't figure out the vector, how it was that the bees were getting the seed treatment from the plants until they discovered that plants um, they exude a certain nectar or, or water that's concentrated with their nutrients in the morning, like dew. And these, these uh, bees fan the, uh, the hive to keep the air conditioning going all night, and they get exhausted, so they immediately leave the hive in the morning and go to the, the nearest source of nutrition, which is this nectar on the plants nearby. But this nectar or water contains the insecticide as well. So now they understand the vectors in terms of how these honeybees are getting large doses of this insecticide. And one of the characteristics of colony collapse disorder is that there's oftentimes no bees in the hive, that they go out and they don't come back. So we think that the neonicotinoid seed treatments, which were increased because of the use of genetic engineering, is probably responsible for, or at least in large part, of colony collapse disorder. But there are more deaths among the bees in the United States than in other countries. And we think that that increase might be the result of genetically engineered crops, particularly the Bt toxin, which is designed to kill insects. It's not acutely toxic to bees, but in some studies, they found that the bees that grabbed pollen from the corn plants that were genetically engineered, they actually were susceptible to a viral infection, whereas the controls were not. There was another study that showed that when the bees took the pollen, the the genes from the genetically modified crops transferred into the microorganisms inside the guts of the bees. This also happens in, in humans. This could mean long-term effects from short-term exposure. Genetically modified foods and crops are one of the most dangerous health and environmental catastrophes we're facing. And yet very few people know about it. There's very few money. There's very few organizations funding those of us who are trying to stop it. I mean, I struggle year after year with you know, a skeleton crew, and I see things like global warming just pulling millions and millions of dollars, and we just get chump change and volunteers to try and stop this juggernaut. 
Fortunately, it's easier to stop GMOs than it is these other problems because we don't have to affect government policy. We can do it through market choices. And that's what we plan to do.